This edition of the Ridley Report is brought to you by Jesus is the way, the truth, the life dot com Did you know that there were three Irish Republican armies? Well, actually, they were probably, I would bet, more, than, more, like, more like five or six, depending on how you count them. But what I'm trying to point out is that there were essentially three different sets of rebellions, at least, uh, in, uh, spread across the uh, 20th century uh, by groups calling themselves the IRA. And uh, the fate of each of them uh, weighs, I think, heavily on those of us in America who discuss the, uh, the whole... Um, you know, that whole weighty question of when do you use violent resistance against uh, uh, what exactly? Uh, when do you use it and what do you use it against? Uh, the second of the three major IRA rebellions, which I think referred to, the, to itself as the Irish Republican Army, is the one that's, uh, I think, the most, it has the most to tell us, and it is the one that is also the most forgotten. Most people are somewhat familiar with the most recent IRA, either the one that was operative mostly in the 70s and 80s, and which was uh, apparently a pretty bad bunch. Some people still are aware of the original Irish War of Independence in around 1919, which was uh, a much more honorable affair and much more successful. Uh, but there was, a, there was an interim struggle. Uh, of course, you know, as you are aware, probably, the... The first rebellion resulted in a partition of Ireland, and most of it was essentially liberated back to the Irish, and uh, the British held on to the, the northern part, really just a few counties. But this was a source of uh, concern for many years, the fact that uh, this, this northern part was sort of cut off. There was almost a fortified border. There were concerns about the treatment of Catholics there. So uh, a, a different, uh, you know, a second sort of revolution sp uh, sp uh, or maybe you could call it a, an invasion, uh, occurred in the middle of the, the 20th century. And, and it's a fascinating case study because it's one of the few armed rebellions that was uh, relatively ethical in its scope. Again, it was a little bit like the Irish War of Independence where there were pretty strict rules of engagement imposed on the uh, these uh, Catholic, you know, dominated... Uh, rebels, if you want to call them, that wanted to push the British all the way out of England, or, I mean, all the way out of <laughs> Ireland, you know, out, of, out of Northern Ireland. And there were a series of cross-border raids and flying columns and limited engagements. And these IRA were, again, pretty heavily restricted against uh, endangering civilians, and they took some pains not to, to cause a lot of killing against soldiers either. They attempted to conform to the Geneva Convention, they had uniforms... Uh, but they were, to a large extent, just rubbed out, and the, their uh, their rebellion forgotten. And to the extent that it was not forgotten, I mean, the the follow up, uh, you know, if it was a follow up at all, was the uh, the really cruel IRA rebellion in the uh, in the seventies and eighties. So you have, on the one hand, this uh, relatively honorable bunch that completely gets forgotten, and then you have the you know the crazed uh, bomber types going after schoolgirls, and everyone remembers them. So it's like, I think to, to, to me what this reminds us is that the violent rebellion, the, the honorable violent rebellion, it's almost unheard of, and it, its limitations result in it being forgotten. I didn't even know such a rebellion had occurred until I saw you know, a documentary about it around 2011. It's just a reminder of what a... Uh, blunt instrument warfare is for shaping anything, not necessarily one that should be ruled out in all circumstances, but it is just so uh, hard to get it right. In fact, it is probably impossible to get it right, or at least so impractical as to border on impossible. Even when the element of taxation is removed from it, as it probably was in some of these Irish rebellions, the results are still piss poor. When you add in the element of taxation, then you get something more like, you know, at its best, maybe, at its least bad, uh, the American efforts in World War II. There you had at least, you know, the occupations of foreign countries without large-scale atrocities against the occupied population. Again, just talking about the Americans here, not the Soviets. Uh, whatever atrocities the Americans committed during the war, they weren't particularly brutal in terms of occupying 
the actual occupation of Germany or the occupation of Japan. There was a degree of restraint there after the war was over. But again, U.S. taxpayers were put on the hook forever uh, in almost infinite amounts uh, that will never be repaid, and the freedoms we lost during that war will never get back until the federal government is no more. We might not even get them back then. Anyway, uh, just looking at one or two wars there, there are other wars that could be considered relatively justified, like the Zapatista War in Mexico, recently, and the... By the way, I should, I should back up. I, I say that the Zapatista War is relatively justified in the sense that I think the Zapatistas were closer to being in the right. I'm not saying the Mexican government was justified, but uh, that was in the, the late 90s, I guess, and there was, uh, I mean, again, so few other warfare, wars that even come close to being justifiable. Well, again, theoretically they might be justifiable, but you can't really back any of the factions in most cases. Oh, I guess the Bosnian War, uh, the Bosnian government side, might be another example of a relatively just cause. But again, all the different atrocities committed by all the different relatively justified factions in all these different wars, that's what gives me pause when it comes to the idea of a just war, or at least the idea of any side ever qualify, qualifying as a full-fledged good guy, much less a successful good guy. Think on these things long and hard before engaging in warfare. Does anybody want some chuck? Porcupine Christians. Even if you don't want to get arrested with them, you might want to hang out with them. Although they don't get that much attention, perfectly normal Christian families are an important part of the Free Stater movement, and pork fest specifically. You'll find a cluster of them at campsites two and four. Drop by if you like. Porkfest is just as accepting of religion as it is of libertines. To learn more, visit Jesus is the way, the truth, the life dot com.